America's done some strange things to other countries over the years. I can't go over all of them in one video. I have, however, prepared five digestible topics for you today and garnished them with a mild amount of humor. And this intro should now be long enough that I will not get demonetized for the joke I make during the first topic. So let's get cooking. You can't have a video on strange US foreign policy without the chicken tax. Just like you can't be a successful YouTuber in Tampa, Florida without a guy that looks like this as your right hand man. In 1964, the US was making a lot of chicken. A lot of that chicken was going to France and West Germany at prices much lower than their homegrown chicken. In their opinion, too much chicken. So to protect their local poultry industry, they placed tariffs on chicken imported from the US. In retaliation to this, Lyndon B. Johnson and his penis worked to impose a 25% tariff on foreign made potato starch, dextrin, brandy, and light trucks to get back at them. How did light trucks end up in there, you wonder? Well, apparently there were some backroom dealings between LBJ and the United Auto Workers involving their election endorsement of him. The Volkswagen Type 2, also known as the VW bus, had been getting a little too popular. Over time, the other goods in the original tariff have returned to normal except the light truck part. In fact, it has even been made more strict over time to now include two-door SUVs as of 1989. This has led to some creative attempts at loopholes, including putting seats in the back of the Subaru Brat so it would be called a passenger car. Due to this tariff, Toyota, Nissan, and Honda created plans to make their trucks in the US. A new car maker called Ineos, who makes off-road vehicles that definitely are not based on old Land Rover Defenders, has run into the chicken tax recently. You see, their SUV starts at about 73,000 US dollars while their upcoming pickup will reportedly cost 86,000 US dollars due to them being built in France. The ones who do the most to get around this rule are actually the American manufacturers. A significant amount of GM trucks are made in Canada and Mexico, and Ram has a large plant in Mexico. Ford trucks are assembled in the US, but a lot of the parts are made in Mexico. This is because NAFTA and the United States-Mexico Trade Agreement have provided a loophole that they can use. Although Ford got a little too cheeky trying to get around this tariff in recent years. See, the Ford Transit Connect, which are the little vans you see florists and bakers often use, were not made in North America. They were made in Turkey. Passenger vehicles only have a 2.5% tax instead of the 25% tax. So all the vans coming out of Turkey would be set up as passenger vans with rear seats and windows. So they were passenger vehicles. Then once they got to Baltimore, most of them would have the seats taken out and the windows replaced with metal panels. Eventually, Customs and Border Protection ruled that old vans would require a 25% tax going forward. Ford sued and eventually in 2020, the Supreme Court sided with Customs. The 2023 model year was the last year for the Transit Connect, even though it was still selling at a decent rate considering the supply issues the world was going through. It outsold the Lincoln Navigator, the Mazda Miata, and the Toyota GR86. I linked a sales figure chart in the additional reading section down below. This seems like a bit of a I'll take my toys and go home situation. This one is less deep and world altering than the ones that will follow it, although it would make my life better if I could get a Toyota Hilux Champ or a Suzuki Jimny, but let's get into how the US changed the structure of the country that makes those vehicles. <laughs> As part of Japan's surrender at the end of World War II, their government had to be restructured under the supervision of the Allied powers. This was laid out by the Potsdam Declaration in 1945, which states, The Japanese government shall remove all obstacles to the revival and strengthening of democratic tendencies among the Japanese people. Freedom of speech, of religion, and of thought, as well as the respect for the fundamental human rights, shall be established. It also says, until that happens, Japan will be occupied by Allied forces. The man who was put in charge of this was U.S. General Douglas MacArthur. Goal number one for Japan to complete was that they needed to amend their current constitution. Many different drafts were put forward by different groups both in the government and by civilians. This on top of political delays in the process due to reluctance from Emperor Hirohito and others in the Japanese government, as well as the former Prime Minister Kanoe trying to insert himself, led to this process taking longer than it was supposed to. Due to this, in 1946, MacArthur and his command announced that they would be writing the Constitution. They used a proposal by a Japanese group called the Constitution Study Group as inspiration, but still mostly written by Americans. The bulk of the writing was done by Lieutenant Colonel Milo Rowell and Major Courtney Whitney, who both had law degrees. They created a draft with others in MacArthur's office, which was then adjusted by Japanese scholars and later the Prime Minister's cabinet. It came into effect on May 3, 1947. It included limiting the Emperor's power and giving it to a parliament called the National Diet, similar to the United Kingdom's government structure. It also included anti-discrimination rules, right to property, due process, workers' rights, freedom of speech, right to a fair trial, and the abolishment of the nobility as well as other common civil rights. It also included limiting their military abilities. Article 9 states the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. It also says they will not maintain military forces, although they do have the Japanese self-defense forces. The JSDF, however, is a far cry from their pre-war military power, which included arguably the most powerful navy in the world. 
Japan's current constitution has not been amended at all since this went into effect. To this day, it is still sometimes referred to as the MacArthur Constitution. With the rising tensions in Eastern Asia, I would not be surprised if the First Amendment to it is restoring military capabilities, likely with the American government's blessing. It is strange to consider that the fourth largest economy in the world operates on a document whose creation was so tightly controlled by a foreigner, especially one that smokes such a goofy-ass pipe. Now let's hop over to the country that gave us CL. The United States and South Korea have had a strange tangled relationship in the years following the Korean War. Today we are focusing on the Republic of Korea United States Combined Forces Command. This was an arrangement that was set up in 1978 in case North Korea attacks South Korea. If that happens, all South Korean and US forces will report to the Combined Forces Command, which is headed by a US general at all times. But they do have a South Korean general as a deputy. Side note, on the Wikipedia page for the Combined Forces Command, they have pictures for the US commanders and South Korean deputies. Most of them look like normal military pictures. There's even this guy who's picture makes him look like a fun time. Then you have poor General Lee and General Han here, who I don't even think they knew their picture was being taken. It's fucked up. So if someday South Korea faces their darkest hour, they instantly fall under the command of the American military. Although the South Korean military does operate on its own accord the rest of the time. It does make sense to some extent to eliminate panic in a time of confusion, but it is still an odd arrangement. Imagine that the autonomy of your nation is under threat from invasion, and the instant response to this is to hand over control of your military. When you combine this level of control with the US military's many failures at holding its personnel responsible for crimes off base as well as against fellow service members, I understand the resentment many people in South Korea hold against the US military. At least the US government is finally starting to address the issues with crime in the military. Until recently, if military personnel committed a crime, it was largely up to their commanding officer if they were charged. Now it is up to an independent military prosecutor. South Korea has definitely become one of the countries most embedded in the American military industrial complex. But next we'll see what happens when the military industrial complex gets complex. French. This one is more current events. In 2016, Australia signed a deal with France to buy 31 billion euros worth of diesel electric submarines. Over the next couple years, this deal turned into a 56 billion euro deal for 12 submarines. On August 30, 2021, French and Australian officials released a joint statement saying they were still dedicated to this deal. A few weeks later, Australia announced, submarine ship ended with France, now US, UK, my submarine dealer. Australia announced that they were entering a new defense partnership with the US and UK, which included a new deal for nuclear submarines for Australia. This happened despite the fact that Australia had already put about 1.5 billion euros into the French project. They also ended up paying another 555 million euros to cancel the contract. This also enraged French President Macron, who recalled his ambassadors from the US and Australia. For like a week? I'm also not sure why he didn't recall the UK ambassador, especially considering the UK foreign secretary supposedly did a lot of the negotiating. Aside from pissing off the French, this deal is strange for another reason. Only six countries have nuclear submarines. They are the US, the UK, India, France, Russia, and China. These are all countries that have extensive nuclear capabilities. Australia will become the first country to buy into having nuclear submarines, at least as far as we know. This new pact, also known as AUKUS, has other parts to it as well. It also has the three countries agreeing to work together on defense tech like hypersonic missiles, better radar, and cybersecurity. Other countries are also being considered to join this deal, including Japan being a favorite, according to US Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel? So why is this happening? Well, dick measuring mostly. China and the US have both been expanding their capabilities in the Pacific through defense packs and new bases. This is part of a lot of posturing both countries are doing right now. China wants to be seen as a true superpower, and the US wants to be seen as the only superpower. If you watch the news, both countries are constantly saying new things about each other. This is the diplomatic equivalent of two bros bumping their chests together repeatedly, threatening to fight each other even though they never will. They are huge trading partners as well as nuclear powers. If there was ever a war, it could be the end of both countries and everyone knows it. They are spending tons of money and goodwill because they want to win over smaller countries to have more allies than the other one. This is just a cloud off and France got left out. So let's float on to our last topic. A US Navy ship called the USS Maine blew up and sank in the Havana Harbor. This kicked off the Spanish-American War which lasted seven months and led to the death of over 600,000 soldiers across both sides. The US claimed that the ship had hit a mine left by the Spanish and considered it an act of aggression. This was not an official cause for war, but the coverage of the sinking in the press led to the public sentiment swaying towards war with Spain. The thing is, there's a pretty good chance there was no mine. There have been numerous investigations over the years from the time it happened up till today. The results of these investigations have been split. The Samson's Board of Inquiry, which was the first official investigation by the US, concluded it was a mine. There have been a lot of criticisms of this board, ranging from its selection to the actual proceeding. Multiple people within the Navy and even at the hearings put forward that it was very possible that the ship blew up due to a coal fire on the ship igniting its ammunition. The Navy had been having more issues with these fires at the time due to changing from anthracite coal to bituminous coal. Bituminous coal has a higher chance of releasing flammable gases in storage. This can lead to fire 
fires and explosions, especially in confined spaces like a ship. In fact, shortly after the explosion, a naval captain named Philip Alger said a coal fire being the cause was very likely. Theodore Roosevelt, who was the assistant secretary of the Navy at the time, wrote a letter basically saying, Shut your whore mouth, Alger. In the years since, it seems like the conclusions of the investigations are 50-50 as to whether it was a mine or just a fire. Despite how up in the air the cause of the sinking is, it was good enough for William Randolph first. He had papers to sell, warmongering was a great way to sell them. The US government was happy to go along with it as a way to get a European power away from their territory and to gain control of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Well, that's all I have for you. Have a great day and eat something good.